Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event. My name is Chris, and I'm here tonight on behalf of Pluto Press. Um, as you all know, we're here to launch Leo Cohen's new book, uh, Border Nation, A Story of Migration, uh, which is the latest in our Outspoken by Pluto series. And it's a fantastic book. Uh, and if you haven't already pre-ordered it, then I obviously encourage you to do so. Um, it's officially released in two days time this weekend. Um, and it's available now from plutobooks.com. Uh, you can also get 20% off by using the coupon border nation, that's one word, at the checkout. Um, and that discount also applies to the four books that are already published in that series as well. And we'll put details of that offer uh, in the live chat in just a minute. So Leah is going to be joined on the panel this evening by Helen Brewer and Misha Fraser Carroll, uh, who's going to be chairing the discussion today. So from me, just a couple more bits of housekeeping before we uh, get underway. Um, so firstly, there's going to be a Q&A as part of tonight's event. So if you do want to put a question to any of the panelists, all you need to do is just pop it down in the YouTube live chat, and then we'll be forwarding those questions onto the panelists. Uh, lastly, if you want to find out about more upcoming live stream events from Pluto, including more events with Leah uh, and fellow outspoken authors as well, uh, then do head over to plutobooks.com forward slash events. Uh, and of course, you can subscribe uh, to our YouTube channel as well. Okay, I think that's all from me. So again, on behalf of Pluto, I'm really pleased that you're all here. It's going to be an excellent event. Uh, and I'm going to hand you over now to Misha to get us underway properly. So Misha, over to you. Thanks so much, Chris. And hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here tonight launching this book um, to introduce myself. Um, my name is Misha Fraser Carroll. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a columnist at The Independent and online editor at the Runnymede Trust, which is Britain's leading race equality think tank. To introduce the author of the book that we're going to be talking about today, um, Leah Cowan is former politics editor at Gowden magazine. She works at Project 17, an advice centre which supports migrant families with no recourse to public funds. She speaks on race, gender and migration, including for UN women in the House of Commons and at the Trade Unions Congress and has written for Vice, Open Democracy and The Guardian. And um, I forgot to mention at the beginning, Leah uses she, her pronouns. We're also joined by Helen Brewer, who uses she and her pronouns. She researches and organizes for border abolition. Helen is a PhD candidate at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths, the University of London. Her work is concerned with the cultivation of knowledge in resistant spaces the construction of solidarity infrastructures and a critical spatial analysis of borders. On March 28th, 2017, Helen was one of the 15 people who took direct action to block a mass deportation charter flight from violently removing people to Nigeria and Ghana, um, also known as the Stanstead 15. And the book that I am so excited to be here launching today is Border Nation, A Story of Migration. This book is all about how basically oppressive borders must be resisted. The book looks at the function of borders, both in the abstract, but also in the concrete. While borders are so often sold to us as these unshakable apolitical facts, this book exposes their inherent violence. It looks at corporate profiteering from borders and how policies around borders are ramping up. The book is also a rallying cry for resistance. It debunks every myth and misconception perpetuated about borders in the public realm. As the book builds, it discusses solidarity in a genuinely galvanizing way, and it makes the case for imagining a world that is free from borders and the violence that comes with them. It's really exciting to be talking about this today, um, especially as someone who personally has worked with Leah at Gaudem, um, where she was the politics editor and I was the opinions editor. And just on a personal level, my politics have really been influenced and shaped by Leah as a friend, a colleague, and just as someone who has really enjoyed her writing. Um, so yeah, uh, shall I get going with my questions? Um, so the first thing I wanted to ask you about, Leah, 
Oh, sorry. First, Leah is going to talk about her book um, and just tell us a bit more about the background before I get into questions. Thanks so much, Misha. Um, I just wanted to start with some thank yous. So firstly, to Pluto for trusting me to write this book um, and for everyone who's helped to bring this launch together, Kieran and Chris, um, and of course, my editor, Neda and James, for your support with getting the book out there and into people's hands and onto their non-Amazon e-readers. Um, thanks also to Misha and Helen tonight, who will be bringing what I know will be rich and thought-provoking insights um, and preventing this launch from just being a narcissistic enterprise about me. Um, thank you for everyone who's come tonight. Um, none of us could have predicted, of course, that this launch would be online when we set out, but it's meant that so many more people can attend. So for that, I'm very grateful. Thank you to friends and family for supporting throughout the process of writing this book. Uh, from Ella, who was there and took me out for lasagna when I nearly got electrocuted by a washing machine in Rome when I was working on the final edit, to Neda, my editor, who gave such patient and insightful edits and everyone in between. Um, I really feel like it takes a village to raise a book. Um, and I knew from the start that I wasn't doing it alone, which is what ultimately made it possible. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about the book. So the book is a radical introduction to Britain's borders. And it's radical in the true sense of really kind of scrutinizing the fundamental nature of what borders are and how they came about. So that involves looking at Britain's colonial history and the key role that Britain has played in colonizing and invading in different ways kind of throughout history, 90% of the world. And thinking about how that links to the oppressive border regime that we now live in. So the book is about joining the dots between Britain's kind of marauding colonial past and the present day hostile environment, which um, if you don't know, is a web of policies um, knit together by a very specific political agenda, which seeks to make life in the UK um, untenable for migrant communities. Um, if we look at, for example, the Windrush scandal, in which Caribbean elders who came to the UK between 1948 and 1970 were targeted for deportation by the Home Office. This is a really kind of classic example of what the hostile environment does. So we're talking about elders, people like my grandfather who came over from Jamaica in the 50s, who have lived here for many years, perhaps identify proudly as British, call the UK their home, um, being told in the most violent way possible that they do not belong. And the Windrush scandal, I think, is a really key example of the brutality of Britain's border regime, the seeds for which were sown many centuries ago with things like the colonial projects and the transatlantic slave trade. And I decided to write the book because I wanted to create what I hope is a kind of relatively digestible piece of literature which brings together information, obviously through the lens of my analysis, about Britain's border in one place. So whether we're talking about immigration detention or deportation, right to rent checks, racist media reporting around the migrant crisis which peaked around 2015 and saw a vast amount of people dying um, trying to get to safety across the Mediterranean Sea and so on, all of these elements are part of the border regime. Yet, when I was kind of starting to learn about this, I was really struggling to find information which looked at the interplay between these different pieces and also the historical foundations of inequality which have produced the current border regime as we know it. So I wanted to create something that felt readable for a range of people, including people who may have some understanding of the violence of borders, whether through their own lived experience or their own reading or their work um, on the topic, but also maybe people that have no real grounding um, in kind of border politics at all, but maybe have a bit of a prickling sense that the myth of the border, this idea that some people deserve to be in the UK and have access to everything that comes with that, and that some people don't, that that myth kind of really didn't add up. Um, so I wanted to create something that could uh, enable people to start to kind of unpick the complexity of Britain's border 
and set the scene for kind of asking your own questions about the status quo and whether it, it kind of makes sense. Um, and I hope that people will take from it, or maybe one thing that people might take from it is the idea that borders are a fiction, ultimately. They're a fiction kind of created in the minds of ostensibly white, powerful men to protect the interests of capital and money making. Um, and to kind of enable the wealth that's been hoarded through the colonial projects to stay in the country and pull up that drawbridge so that people who that wealth really belongs to, largely people across the global south, can't access it. Um, and in particular, I hope that I've managed to illustrate that the policing of everyday borders through things like the hostile environment are harmful to our friends, our family, our neighbours, our colleagues, the people that we see every day on our government mandated walks, um, the people in our communities, and that we should resist it at every turn, you know, whether it's right to rent, whether it's document checks in hospital settings and for pregnant people, people giving birth, whether it's the policing and harassment of migrant sex workers or people trying to open bank accounts and finding they can't do that or that their bank account has randomly been frozen because the bank has decided they don't have the right to have one because of their immigration status. All of these elements of the hostile environment are things that we can push back against and I would argue must chip away at as part of a larger goal to break down borders. And that's why, um, as Misha says, the final kind of chapter in the book talks about the resistance that's already happening actually in this country and hopefully provides some inspiration and fire for bellies that are hungry for a different world. And it's a world that I believe is within our grasp even if the road to get there might be a long one. So that's a bit of a spiel about what the book is. Um, and I'll pass back to you, Misha, for your questions. Thank you so much, uh, Leah. And before we get on to my evidently very burning questions, Helen is going to tell us a bit about her perspective on the topics covered in the book. Great, thank you so much. Um, so firstly, congratulations. I am lucky to have the book here filled with highlights and notes. Um, it was such a pleasure to be able to read it. And I wanna thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity to be able to share this moment with you. Um, it's been so rewarding to think about our encounters with each other over the years which have tied us to this shared desire for no borders. And I think um, considering uh, this trial and appeal process that I've uh, have been through is now over, I think it's safe to say that, you know, Leah was there right from the very beginning, um, not to <laughs> implicate you in anything. Um, but I wanna, you know, what I find so compelling about this book is the way you've been uh, is the way that you've laid out a staunchly anti-capitalist, decolonial and feminist approach to understanding the border in all its forms and in, and in all its complexities. So through interrogating the ideological construction of borders in the name of national security, for example, to the everyday embodied encounters migrants face. And what's so important in, the, in this work is that you reframe how we talk about migration, not in defense, but in defiance and in celebration. And it, you say it so well in your introduction that one of the functions of the border is to stem the flow of ideas, of stories, histories. And it reminds me of what Harsha Walia says, which is, we didn't cross borders, the borders crossed us. So to ground this complex, nuanced, entangled, connected, common of migratory paths that existed and will always exist, despite the illusory creation of borders is liberatory. Um, when the border is a constant assault on the body and on our imaginations, we need to normalize its unrealness and its undoing, um, which isn't to take away from the very real violence and oppression which it enforces with impunity, but to do, as you say in the beginning, depart, depart from a position that no one is illegal. Um, so this book, I think, is a critical and crucial companion for anyone who wants to learn more about the UK border regime 
and the ongoing struggles and modes of resistance that um, like you've put so compelling and eloquently in this book to be rooted in anti-capitalism and abolition. So I think that's all I'm gonna say and I'm, I'm looking forward to these questions <laughs> that we can get into. So Leah, the first thing that I wanted to ask you was really more about your personal journey towards writing this book. And um, I wanted to know at what point in your life did you start thinking about borders as an issue and what kind of um, radicalized you towards wanting to write this kind of political book on the topic? Yeah, so um, when I was five, no, um, <laughs> my kind of journey uh, to writing the book comes from both kind of personal and political dimensions and of course the two are intertwined but I suppose my work or organizing for the past 10-ish years has been in the migrants rights and UK feminist movements um, and my day jobs have been in the migrants rights sector and what is known in the UK is the women's sector or the gender-based violence sector kind of addressing the interlocking issues of domestic violence, state violence, sexual violence, sexual harassment, stalking and those kind of things. Um, and what I saw through these experiences of working and organizing against these huge structures of oppression with long, long histories in this country was how the border was such a, um, such a huge antagonist in so many people's lives. Um, for example, I've kind of spoken with migrant survivors who are trying to flee domestic violence where perpetrators are threatening to cancel their visas if they report to the police. And at the same time learned that specialist domestic violence refuges for women of color and migrant women are being shut down and their funding gutted by the government. So these survivors have nowhere to turn, let alone survivors for whom kind of formalized government funding uh, specialist refuges have never existed, such as trans women of color, trans migrant women, migrant sex workers. At the very same time, we know that the police are sharing data with the Home Office. Um, so, for example, we see cases like in 2017, there was a pregnant woman who reported rape at a police station and she was taken to a sexual assault center. And there she was met with immigration enforcement who took her into custody um, and interrogated her about her immigration status. Um, also in my work, I've worked alongside people in immigration detention centers who are facing deportation to countries where um, their lives are at risk or potentially countries they just do not call home. Um, I've met children in a refugee camp in Calais who are living uncomfortable, unsafe, precarious lives, kind of waiting to be reunited with family in the UK. And all of these different experiences of organizing together, working in solidarity with people crossing borders or people for whom the border has, has crossed them, as um, Maharsha says, and having conversations about what the harsh reality of the border actually is, that brought me to a point where I wanted to put that reality down into words specifically focusing on Britain um, and Britain's role in this harm. And to contribute to a conversation that is already happening in different pockets um, where the agreement is that Britain's borders really don't need to exist, um, should not exist, and we can come together to start breaking them down. And when you talk about the ways that so many issues are intertwined with borders and the fact that like most problems in our society are either associated with borders or are exacerbated by borders, like it makes me think of um, uh, Molly Smith and Juno Mack's book, Revolting Prostitutes, about how they talk about um, the fact that it's actually not really a book about sex work, it's a book about borders. Um, and the fact that, yeah, even if we don't see it in kind of mainstream discourses on so many issues, that's what it comes back to. And yeah, such a fantastic book. And I think one of the key things in that, I mean, I reference it um, in my book is around how borders kind of create the sites of violence, particularly if you're talking about things like trafficking, you know, if you don't have the border, there's nothing for someone to be trafficked across. Um, that, that site of violence is very much created by the existence of the border in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanted to ask about, also just having kind of witnessed it, um, working alongside you while you've been writing this book, 
is the fact that COVID struck during the course of writing the book, which I can imagine would be very disorientating because there's so much that has changed that that you can kind of draw upon. Um, and I was wondering how did COVID kind of shine a light on the subject matter of this book? Well, COVID, I actually finished writing the manuscript over a year ago. Um, so I handed in the manuscript, I think in February, 2020, and then COVID hit and I thought, yeah, maybe my book is, you know, ent entirely in need of an update now. Um, but no, the, the border is a, a thing that's here to stay for the time being, I think. Um, I think what I did think about a bit and in some of the edits we did kind of weave this in a little bit is about how COVID really kind of shown, shone, shined, put a light on a kind of inequalities that already existed. So if you think about something like the NHS, the pressures that the, um, the National Health Service is under through over a decade of austerity funding cuts and bits being sold off through privatization, the kind of pressures that were being faced by staff and by patients had been kind of boiling at the surface for many years. But what happened through COVID was that problem suddenly became an issue of national concern or at least governmental concern. Um, and then we see, you know, the, the very same government and voters who were supporting the continued underfunding of the NHS coming out to clap for the carers that they had thrown to the lions and that hypocrisy became very evident. Um, and this is, of course, relevant to the issue of borders because such a key cornerstone of the hostile environment is this idea that migrant communities are a strain on resources, a strain on the NHS. And what we've really seen, I think, throughout the pandemic is that strain there is is through chronic underfunding. The strain is coming from the government um, and the government creating barriers actually for people accessing um, the NHS, whether it's through charging people to access it or checking people's documents. So there's a lot of fear and trepidation for migrant communities who want to access the NHS. And in COVID, in the pandemic, we've seen obviously a disproportionately high amount of people of color, um, whether it's healthcare workers or patients kind of dying of the virus. Um, and we've seen the impacts of, of the border regime play out in that way as well. So I think that was something that I thought about a bit and we did weave it in a bit um, into the edit when that was happening. And to open up to Helen as well, how much do both of you, either of you think that this um, kind of like clap for carers period that you talk about, how much do you think that narratives and, and rhetoric has really changed during this period, if at all? I mean, I what COVID has done is really put the notion of care onto the global kind of agenda now. So people are really interrogating what care really means and what does that look like? And actually what we've been encountering or sorry, what people um, have been experiencing is like an, a state manufactured form of care that's come from the you know neoliberalization of the British welfare state. It's come from like a uh, complicity in uh, enforcing certain kinds of bordering within housing, within healthcare, um, which Leah's you know spoken and written about through the hostile environment. Um, and I think it's what we don't speak enough about is the kind of organized abandonment which is occurring through like austerity and through, you know, uh, placing people in situations of insecurity in which uh, there's either no other choice but to be compliant um, with the state or in, or, to, you know, to an extreme becomes almost like, a, becomes lethal in so many ways. And I think um, what I find really uh, amazing to kind of, when, when reading through this book and, and what ties it all together is this kind of um, notion that, you know, borders are rooted in capitalism. They're rooted in our particular kind of racial capitalism, which um, 
I think the black Marxist Cedric Robinson conceptualizes as like the extraction of socioeconomic value from racialized people. Um, and we can see that as Lee has written and spoken about in the ways in which migrant labor has been exploited within Britain's internal borders um, at the same time as empire expands and extracts resources from uh, you know, the colonies in different ways. So um, uh, for me, like tying all these threads together and understanding actually where, where is it that the border kind of works um, alongside the state, alongside all these different private companies and like, how do we tackle that? Uh, so yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> I mean, I was definitely also thinking kind of more broadly when the pandemic was happening, um, we could kind of see, how, it was interesting how the virus was spreading, right? In terms of who was, who was still moving, who was still mobile, who was still flying. Um, and we saw that the virus kind of caught hold and moved quickest in these kind of international travel hubs and centers of business, whether it's London, Paris, New York. Um, and obviously there are other factors like the kind of median age of those populations, but I think it does say something around border privilege, around who can move and who won't even restrict their movement in a global pandemic, who is not even willing to kind of stop the border crossing they want to do. Um, even when it's putting, you know, other people's lives at risk. So I thought that was kind of interesting to observe as well, thinking about borders specifically. Mm -hmm, definitely. And Helen, when you touch upon how important it is to understand the history of borders and their roots in capitalism and colonialism, I was thinking about how one thing that struck me while reading this book was just how little widespread historical awareness there is of um, the roots of borders and how often, especially in kind of um, right-wing narratives around borders, there's this tendency to conceptualize Britain as this like standalone island that is completely isolated from the rest of the world. And I kind of just wanted to ask, why do you think this is that people, so many people still think this way and why, yeah, is there just such a lack of historical understanding um, about borders and where they come from? Um, you know, I think <laughs> to deviate the question of answering why that is, which uh, I think is a big discussion around, you know, political education. And I think this is what this book is doing. It, it, it's, uh, you know, it's a way to kind of liven uh, these issues um, in, in a way that's extremely accessible um, and understandable. So uh, the kind of, and, and to be honest, the, the different ways in which the UK um, functions contemporarily, like the way that it exerts its power now is pretty, it's largely invisibilized. So like, um, you know, through different forms of state aid, Britain's able to um, propagate relationships with former colonies such as Jamaica, Nigeria, and Ghana to facilitate deportations. Um, you know, another aspect is the fact that uh, the kinds of contemporary, uh, you know, prison infrastructures, the way that um, these different kinds of carceral technologies work, they were honed in through settler colonialism through the, you know, in the history of the plantation, you can see the same kinds of mechanisms of segregation, the same kinds of um, mechanisms of control um, were propagated there and they're still seen in different kinds of contemporary forms now. Um, and I think, you know, Nadine Elanani writes about this very well. And when she looks at the history of immigration law um, and ties that to a history that was embedded within these colonies, the way in, ways in which people were segregated, the ways in which um, people were excluded um, and 
racialized. Uh, and so I think once we understand this history, we can understand the that, uh, um, and I think, again, I go back to Harsha Walia, is that the kind of migrant is a relational term. So, you know, it's a construction by the state uh, and it, it's uh, and it, it's not it's not even an, an identity that people uh, should embody. It's that it's something placed upon a person in order to facilitate um, these different kinds of hierarchies and ordering. Whether you're undocumented, illegal, criminal, whatever, um, and so yeah, I think. Not only is it necessary now, but it's necessary because we are living in a post-Brexit Britain where um, the kind of future of immigration and asylum policy is now firmly up for debate. Uh, and it's up, it, you know, and I think if we think about bordering as something that's purposefully violent by design, then we can expect that there's gonna be ways in which the border is continually redesigned in order to uh, either react to certain types of protests as we can see is happening now, um, or, or, in, or in order to enable to facilitate this illusion that like Britain is a separate, you know, boarded nation living in its so-called splendid isolation from the rest of the world. Yeah, I think the thing around kind of why don't we know about the history of borders if, you know, you just have to look at the British curriculum, at least when I was kind of at school studying, it just doesn't quite go there, right, in explaining Britain's role in, as I said, invading or having some kind of uh, control or interference in 90% of the world. That's a very uncomfortable truth. Um, and the, the teachers that I speak to are very kind of well equipped and willing and eager to kind of learn and share and um, have those lessons with students. It's more about the being an establishment that's unready to reckon with Britain's past and acknowledge what Britain has done and is still doing, as Helen says, um, because that would involve kind of having to do something or give up power. Um, and that's just absolutely not what the establishment wants to do. I think um, definitely when I was at school kind of learning history, you learn about um, the Tudors and Nazi Germany and kind of rinse and repeat, those were the topics. And I think it was a real missed opportunity. A lot of history, the way that it was taught to me at school was as these kind of isolated incidents of things that happened. And it was the kind of context of that was never really explained. So something like Nazi Germany, like a, something like a, the genocide of the Jewish people you know, you only have to look 25 years earlier and there's the Armenian genocide by the Ottoman government, which, you know, the Nazis kind of learned tactics from that genocide and employed them later on. Um, then if you look back to the 18th and 19th century, obviously kind of eugenics and this idea of race science, the invention of the concept of race provides that kind of um, foundation for slavery in the colonial projects, this idea of a white superior race um, and biological essentialism and those stereotypes which still pervade into the present day in, in popular media. I think it's a real missed opportunity that the curriculum really atomizes these events and doesn't show how they're still relevant to the present day. Something, you know, like studying Nazi Germany, what was happening over here in the UK in 1936, you had the British Union of Fascists, you know, marching down Cable Street um, and being met with great resistance from the migrant communities, Jewish and Irish and other socialists um, in the area. Then fast forward 77 years in 2013, you have the English Defence League, a neo-fascist right-wing Islamophobic group trying to march down Whitechapel High Street, which runs parallel to Cable Street towards the East London Mosque. And I think if history lessons could kind of pull together the through lines of these incidents and show how they're not kind of isolated things, how it's a, a tapestry of, of racism, then I think that would be much more useful and fruitful. Um, not only showing the kind of long history of racism 
in this country, but also the long history of popular resistance to it, I think is very important to learn about. Mm, and as you were talking about that, I was thinking about my own history um, lessons and curriculum in school. And I was thinking about how, as like someone who at that age did consider myself quite a political person, never really managed to get into history because I felt like a lot of it was like, run, like you say, like learning by rote and this sort of like atomized approach to historical events, which isn't really about understanding or connecting them to the present, um, but more about kind of reciting what happened um, without that much interrogation. Um, I want to briefly remind people that we're going to do a QA and a um, in about 10 minutes. So definitely do be thinking of your questions. If you have questions that jump off of these topics um, and put them in the comments, if you have them. The next thing I wanted to talk about was this book discusses abolition um, and the idea that abolition of borders to many people seems like something that is impossible. Um, and you also touch on the uh, sort of debate between reform versus abolition. So I wanted to read a quote um, which says, work to amend immigration laws and policies is important insofar as it improves people's lives in the here and now, but we must carefully consider the ways in which reforming an inherently abusive border regime makes it harder to destroy it altogether. Just as air inside a balloon would never advocate for bursting the skin that holds it, states as we know, and we know them will never support steps towards their own eradication. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, that conversation about reform versus abolition and the idea that reform is sort of moving in the right direction. But like you say, actually, sometimes steps that look like they're moving in the right direction can um, kind of be seen to have done enough because they've moved in the right direction um, and mean that people don't think about abolition and the very real possibility of abolishing borders. So I wanted to ask about that and also how you came to an abolitionist stance. Yeah, I mean, I think the question about reform versus abolition, it's about two, two different approaches, I guess, isn't it, of looking at a harmful institution, whether it's borders or and there's been lots of conversations in the past kind of eight months around abolishing the police and abolishing prisons. Um, and a reformist approach would be to kind of look at those things and say, maybe there are some things that we can tweak, we can improve, you know, maybe if we have a women's prison or we have a nice mural or, you know, that we can do things that can kind of make it a bit better. Um, and of course, some of those improvements, as, as um, I say in the book, have very important kind of positive impacts on people's material day-to-day -day lives. But the concern is that it also makes that a much more kind of palatable thing, which makes it more ultimately more difficult to kind of take down and dismantle altogether. Um, and thinking about this, particularly in relation to kind of migration and borders, we I often find that there's a kind of strata um, of migrants when people are talking about um, you know who deserves to be here and who doesn't you get the kind of deserving and undeserving migrants right and at the top of that um, strata there's um, maybe women families people with children LGBT people asylum seekers people who can make um, or for whom emotive cases can be made for why that person deserves to be in the country and then as you move towards the bottom of that strata you might get um, you know, somebody who's what might be called an economic migrant or somebody who's come to the country for a job or to um, bring their family for a more comfortable life or maybe somebody who has a, served a criminal sentence, what might be referred to as a foreign national offender um, if you were a right-wing newspaper. And with the kind of reformist approach, I think, um, or reforming the border, making the border kinder or making it like an easier system to navigate maybe, that top bracket of people potentially would see some um, immediate kind of material improvements, but there'd still be this huge wealth of people at the bottom for whom the border would remain exactly the same. And so I think the reason why an abolitionist approach is more useful is it because it looks at the kind of fundamental roots of the problem. It says this thing is harmful, this thing is violent, and we need to remove it altogether. We can't be selective and try and improve little pieces of it because that approach won't acknowledge 
or undo the kind of unequal histories that underpin the border that have brought us to this point um, where people from kind of fallen colonies have had their resources taken and now can't access them where they've been hoarded in the UK. So yeah, the abolitionist approach I think is a bit more um, holistic and kind of looks at the fundamentals of why these things aren't working um, and says that we should get rid of them altogether. I just wanted to add just a, a small thing um, after what you've just said, and mostly because I love talking about abolition, uh, but I uh, love this kind of quote by Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who talks about abolition not being absent, but absence, but presence. And I think there's another side to abolition that, that really needs to be um, embedded in our thinking around it, which is that we're not just getting rid or dismantling um, these structures, but we're building something and we're building them now, we're building them, them in the present. So abolition isn't like a far off future that we're trying to like head towards. In a way it is, but we're doing that work now in the present. And so we're building those community structures, we're building these solidarity relationships and we're transforming the ways in which we address harm, not through punitive measures, not to criminalization, uh, but through a new kind of alternative uh, understandings and ways of living. And I think, um, Another thing is that, and I think you, you know, you, you tie that all together so well in your book, Leah, is that, you know, orders, they're, they can't, they, uh, they embody so much of uh, what's harmful in society. And, and this is recognizing that the logics and relationships between policing, between criminalization, between um, incarceration are all tied up together. And so abolition is really departing from a point where you can start to look, uh, you know, and see how the, how these things inter interconnect and how um, imagining uh, and creating new ways, modes of living can, uh, can propagate. And I think Another abolitionist, Mariam Kaba, says, you know, like, what if we had billions of dollars to spend on better housing, better health care, you know, um, you know, addressing a lot of these kinds of questions right at the end of your book, which I find so powerful and helpful to, to you know, address. It's like, oh, where will everyone go, you know, and, and these are such um they, they force us to really challenge ourselves in thinking about that. Uh, and I think these kinds of difficulties between abolition and reform, you know, it really forces us to address the hardest questions um, first and fight those big fights first, uh, because that's, that's the only way we'll be able to ensure that everyone is included in this fight. Yeah, and on that topic of what it forces us to think about, I really like the ways in which it forces us to go from a starting point. It doesn't assume that violence is the starting point and is inevitable. And that idea that we can use our imaginations to not just imagine futures with less violence, but violence still exists, like the concept that that border violence could be something that is completely eradicated. And Relatedly to some of the topics you were talking about just then, Helen, I wanted to ask about the connection between detention and prisons, which you talk about in the book, Leah. Yeah, I mean, oh, do you want to go, Helen? No, 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 you go first. I'll add on at the end. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, so a, a quick 101 on immigration detention. It's the immigration detention estate in the UK, there's kind of seven detention centers at the moment, um, and they effectively operate as category B high security prisons. Um, people can be detained indefinitely um, in immigration detention in the UK with the only country in Europe who detains people indefinitely in these settings. 
and um, people are most likely to kind of get detained when they're arriving in the country or if they're reporting as part of their kind of conditions on their leave or if they're seeking asylum or at a raid or a spot check. Um, and one of the kind of particularly sinister details about immigration detention is that um, it's kind of framed as an administrative process, not a criminal procedure. And because of that, um, you can be detained uh, without the kind of approval of a court or a judge. Um, it's kind of no trial. You're just detained on the decision of an immigration official. Um, not that I would approve of detaining someone if there was scrutiny at all as a prison abolitionist, but I guess my point is even by the laws of the land, immigration detention is a very kind of shady process. Um, and I think the connection with prisons is immigration detention centers, six of the seven that exist at the moment are privately run. So they're run by private kind of profit making companies. Um, and what that means is these companies are kind of profiting from the misery of people who are being detained in them. Um, and they kind of um, respond to these government tenders. They offer these very low um, prices in order to run the centers. And for example, if the government says, okay, you can have 120 pounds a day for every person you detain, then that company is gonna try and spend as little as possible, obviously on the well-being and welfare of that person in order to rake in a big profit, which goes into their, the pockets of their shareholders. So it's a pretty kind of disgusting system and how it operates um, and the kind of creeping expansion of private prisons in the UK um, is, is very alarming and something that's being fought back against as well. I mean, I don't have much to add. Um, I think that was a pretty comprehensive answer to the question. I think the only other thing that I think um, is important to note is that, you know, the kind of prison expansion scheme is well underway in this country. And there's um, right now a lot of resistance to the building of these, um, uh, yeah, of, of these cages. Uh, and I think uh, there is a, a lot of fear in which like this is, you know, becoming closely uh, related to the kinds of um, prison geographies that we see in the US. Um, and it's, I think, also important to note that, you know, detentions uh, don't exist as single entities within the internal border network. They're very much, you know, connected to the infrastructure of deportation. They're also very much connected to uh, sign-in centers and to temporary accommodation and the ways in which people are dispersed to different parts of the country where they have no access to community um, and have to travel, you know, long distances in order to fulfill these demands made by the state. Um, and so the sim same kinds of carceral, well, similar kinds of carceral mechanisms you find in detention are being employed in other more kind of obfuscated ways. So through this surveillance regime um, that we can kind of now like really pinpoint with this new bill, for example. Uh, and so understanding how, you know, these kinds of quasi penal spaces are operating alongside detention gives you this kind of like vast realization that, yeah, the, the kind of board, bo the ways in which the border is operating is, um, you know, a way to kind of uh, spread its power across multiple geographies. Mm -hmm. And understanding the links between all of these different institutions is also crucial for thinking about how we resist and how we organize. And before I go on to audience questions, the last thing I wanted to ask about was, Leah, you write in depth about solidarity. Um, you write specifically, for example, about how um, 
people on flights will refuse to buckle their seatbelts until the person being deported at the back of the flight is, is removed and things like this. And you also talk about how this kind of solidarity often involves inherently decolonizing um, our minds and our relationships with other people. And whenever I think about this, it makes me think about Meg John Barker, who's a psychologist and, and writer. And they write about how when we think about relationships and friendships or romantic relationships, we have to think about the people who in your minds are excluded from having a relationship with you, people who you don't extend empathy to or think about their circumstances, whether that's geographical or um, due to like differences in yeah where they are in the world or language or things like this. And I was thinking, I wanted to ask, how would you encourage people to extend solidarity and also to resist? Do you want to go first, Helen, or? Um, I guess I was thinking about this a lot in relation to what's been happening this week because it's so topical. And I think, you know, one, one thing that it brought up for me was that we shouldn't have to wait. We shouldn't have to wait for something like this to happen because the left often finds itself in these reactive positions to new legislation or like the will of the state and they're changing policies. So I feel like um, for me, it's, a, it, it's about disrupting now, you know, the revolution is happening now and we don't need to wait for, uh, for and, and the mobile, and that's not to discount how important it is and how inspiring the mobilization has been around it. It's that we find ourselves um, often in the, on the back foot, I think a lot of the time, and we need a much more kind of proactive approach in our disruption, in our defiance and in being bold around what our protests are and what they mean to us um, and not, uh, and you know, what the state is trying to do and trying to define what that protest should be or what that should look like, which is the antithesis of, you know, uh, the demands that we are making. So I think it's important to not only mobilize one against this bill in all its forms, but to consistently mobilize around the issues that uh, and struggles that we are tied to, whether that be against immigration detention, against deportations, um, or in solidarity with people on the front lines through creating uh, infrastructures of care, for example, um, and facilitating different modes of solidarity. Uh, and, you know, I've been so, I'm so inspired and I can't, can't, I guess, wait to see what happens next because I feel like this is a catalyst point. Um, and it's really, it's really put, yeah, it's really kind of put us in a position considering everything we've experienced over the past year or so, where we're ready. We're just like really ready right now. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. I think um, that kind of solidarity work and mobilizing work also needs to be, or can easily be underpinned by people's own kind of research and, and learning and reading around the topic. I mean, particularly if we're thinking about Britain's borders, there's a kind of wealth of literature um, that people can kind of brush up on. There's a website that I reference a lot um, in the book called Detained Voices, where you can go and kind of read verbatim testimonies um, of people in immigration detention centers. Um, and I think the kind of second aspect to that kind of solidarity and, and learning work and building work is around organizing in your kind of local communities. So rather than um, thinking about resources being a very kind of limited thing, thinking about 
what is it that my community needs? Like, we probably don't need another immigration detention center for women as they're trying to build up in um, Durham County. We, you know, might need libraries, we might need um, support with employment, thinking about what are the kind of practical resources that we need to help each other for our communities to be based on kind of strength and care and compassion um, and building from that position. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I wanted to go on to the audience questions, which are now rolling in. So the first question that you've got is what, what's the main takeaway that you hope the millions of readers will get from your wonderful book? Yeah, I, I think, as I kind of said before, this idea that um, very simple idea, I think that borders aren't real, they're, they're a relatively new invention um, and, and therefore we don't have to kind of accept them as something that's inevitable. Um, I think also, hopefully, the kind of last chapter of the book gives some concrete ideas for what people can do. I think, as Helen was kind of mentioning earlier, when we talk about abolishing things, I think it can feel like this very kind of pie in the sky, like, yes, that's a nice idea, but we need to be practical and pragmatic in the here and now, whereas actually um, some of the, the examples that I draw on in the book um, show that there are things that you can do, groups that you can be involved in, actions that you can take um, that are on the road to that kind of final, well, the abolition is the process, right? On the, on the road to that kind of goal of not having the border there at all. The next one is, what do you see as the most common tropes or false solutions progressives fall for when it comes to borders? Again, kind of related to the abolition versus reform conversation. I mean, I think there's a kind of there's a kind of FAQ section at the end of the book which talks through some of those classic questions of like, where's everybody going to live? Um, what about you know the strain on resources? And um, I don't think people are kind of stupid or gullible for asking those questions. I think you know we've been fed a lot of kind of misinformation and hatred. Um, over a very <laughs> over centuries, but you know, particularly over the past couple of decades around um, migrant communities, and I think it can be useful just to kind of look at the the pure facts of the matter. You know, the reason that there's not enough housing in the country isn't because of people coming to the country, isn't because of migrant communities. It's because of you know a lack of social housing being built by the government, the government selling off a lot of council housing stock um, in the 80s, and if we I think what I'd encourage people to do is if you kind of have these questions where you're kind of thinking, what about housing or what about the NHS, like employ a bit of that kind of critical literacy of reading around, reading different titles, not always reading from the same publication, whether it's a tabloid or, you know, a left wing broadsheet, like seeking out different voices and different perspectives and trying to work out, you know, does this really add up? Is this actually the kind of the causality of this is this really what's going on or is it potentially a much bigger kind of systemic issue i think just added to that and i think you know i guess this this might open up a, this is a bigger conversation to be had but i think um it's our kind of reliance on the judicial system to, for justice for different types of justice to be handed down. And I think we need to kind of interrogate the way in which the law um, and the criminal justice system plays in enforcing borders and enforcing like different kinds of legal categorizations. You know, uh, you know people are often find themselves in this kind of judicial corridor awaiting decisions on their appeals, going through tribunal hearings. And so you have this like massive, mostly invisibilized uh, infrastructure um, there. And I think, you know, at the same time as that is working um, and deportation notices are being handed down, we're uh, at, you know, we're kind of, there's kind of a, 
a real reliance, I think, on like the liberal progressives part to like fight things through court systems. And I just, I, I think it just warrants some sort of interrogation because outside of that you have, um, and again, maybe this is tied to, to an abolitionist kind of praxis of thinking, you know, how do we dismantle that as well? Uh, and, 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 and think outside this idea that like, yeah, everyone's equal under the law, which is not true at all. Um, so that was just another point. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of inequality is, is baked into the law. That's the, mm -hmm. the foundation for it. I think for me, a kind of diversity of tactics um, is so important. You know, the classic Audrey Law quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. We know that we can't use the law to dismantle the law. That's not going to happen. But, you know, we can, use, we can use that. And let's also look at other things that we can do um, to resist these structures. Let's not place all of our hope and faith in kind of, um, you know, trying to sue the police, for example, like the police need to not exist as well. We can do that. And also, um, as is happening, you know, have community organizing around those things. Um, the next question, which a few people have asked, actually, is what was the most difficult part of writing the book? Um, and also, what are the most interesting things you learned while writing it? The most difficult part was probably being selective with material. There was a lot that I cut out and couldn't put into the book because it needed to be, I wanted to keep it kind of readable and digestible. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to say about borders in the UK, but the most interesting things, I mean, is this interesting to everyone? I don't know, but there's um, a thing called Hansard, which is like a record of everything that's ever said in parliament since like 1203 or something. I don't know, probably not, probably like a couple of hundred years. Um, and you can kind of do keyword searches in Hansard and it's really fascinating to find out what kind of different politicians at different times have said about different things, um, which isn't very specific, but I think if you are kind of researching something like borders or migration, if you kind of go and do searches in Hansard, you can find out some very, there were some really kind of nerdy things that I just had to cut out because I was like, I'm personally just finding this very fascinating, but like, I don't think it brings us along <laughs> much in the book for me to be quoting from like, I think Lord Rothmere said about like, Earl Grey tea or something. Yeah, something that's also interested about interesting about Hansard is like the words or topics that are never mentioned um, and have never been mentioned. Um, another question, which I think Helen could also probably feed into, is what other types of art have inspired your writing on the on this topic? So films, documentaries, visual art, music, etc. Um, I think definitely documentaries. There's lots of, yeah, very interesting documentaries about borders. There's one in particular, I can't remember the name, but it's a Belgian documentary. It's very harrowing. It's about um, deportations. Maybe you've seen it, Helen. It's, the name is like one word, probably like deportation in French or something. But um, yeah, I think definitely films and documentaries. Hmm. I don't know. I don't have a comprehensive answer. Do you have something more interesting to say, Helen? Um, I would love to uh, plug. Uh, I have, why I don't know why plug isn't the right word. I have no relation to this <laughs> film, but um, it's on Netflix. It's called His House, and it's a horror. Um, I guess on the kind of experience of a couple from. Uh, Sudan, I think, and they find themselves in temporary accommodation and the house is uh, haunted by the kind of ghosts of uh, from like their journey to the UK and it is such a great film and I think so kind of metaphorically rich when we think about hauntings and ghosts and like, um, you know, the kind of 
embodiment of being a ghost and navigating through hostile environments, for example, as well as the kind of uh, ghosts of ones like past and trauma that that come and play out um, in the house. So I can really recommend that film. Um, for me, I'm so, I'm just inspired by writing. You know, Leia's writing, uh, the writing of mostly kind of people from the Black feminist tradition that is just inspiring when we talk about imagination and we talk about envisioning and uh, dreaming up, you know, how these kinds of shared visions and ways in which we can live in the world. So I think for me, it's like, it's about the hopefulness when it comes to art and film and everything. I think there's also definitely something for me around food, a way that the way that food and cooking and kind of sharing meals travels across borders um there's maybe this is a bit lateral but there's a really good episode of chef's table um where is the chef is a woman who um kind of migrated from mexico into the u.s and left her her daughter behind um and she's now kind of got a barbacoa restaurant in philadelphia and she tells her story um very compellingly and i think those types of documentaries um yeah, can be very kind of useful for understanding what that process is and the kind of two sided coin of what you leave behind in the process of border crossing, but also the kind of generative, productive, creative, joyful aspect of um, having this amazing barbacoa restaurant that people come from all over the country to visit um, and what that means to her. That just reminded me of um, your references of Gloria and Zaldua in your book, and I really enjoyed them as kind of a poetic grounding point within the book to kind of, you know, think about the ways in which people cross borders in other parts of the world. Um, The next question that I have is, how do we raise the subject of borders with non-POC friends? It's a good question. Um, I suppose raising, raising the question in terms of kind of talking about border ab abolition, um, I think kind of, yeah, sharing some of the resources that we've discussed. Um, I don't know. I think of, well, it's like one very basic thing, but I remember like one of the first conversations that like I saw a lot of white people having, like when I was at uni, it was the classic, like, why are some people called expats and some people called migrants? Mm. Like these kinds of conversations that in some ways are sort of centered around themselves, <laughs> but do draw attention to like some of these, these sort of um, discrepancies that yeah. some people might not have thought about before. I think because I've been talking about borders for so long, it's hard to kind of think about bringing that conversation in under the, like, under the rug. <laughs> People would be like, okay, right, you're doing the borders thing again. Um, but no, I think it's a very important question to think about how do we have these conversations um, with, with people who, for whom, you know, border crossing is like going on holiday um, and, and nothing more, nothing less, you know, traveling through an airport is a, uh, an experience that they would never even consider would be like anything other than enjoyable or inane. Um, and I think maybe pointing out some of the kind of everyday aspects of the border perhaps might be kind of useful if someone's a, a teacher or working in a healthcare setting, you know, asking questions around, are you having to kind of check documents? What happens if somebody comes in and they're undocumented? You know, what, what provisions do you have in place? Um, I've definitely had those conversations with people who are, are kind of working in, in, a, in a mode of resistance without it even really, you know, being a thing, you know, saying, oh, you know, somebody came into A&E and we, they, they weren't documented, but we just kind of didn't really ask about it. And we 
you know, did this thing and that's fine. Um, and yeah, that kind of popular but unacknowledged form of resistance in a very everyday way, I think is, is a good place to start having that conversation. Yeah, I think the only thing that I would add, um, and this isn't answering the kind of direct question of like, how do we speak about this with non POC friends, but I think also trying to understand the ways in which we could talk about it with groups and movements seemingly uh, outside of the kind of no border movement and trying to figure out ways in which we can kind of connect up these conversations, I think is also kind of a productive way to think about it as well. Um, because, you know, I think at the end of your book, there's a question around like the borders, borders and the environment, for example. And I think obviously there are so many um, overlaps and connections between what we're seeing with climate change and migration. Um, and figuring out ways in which, you know, healthcare, uh, what docs not cops are doing, patients not passports, all these different campaigns that are really linking up together and ensuring that these aren't just single issue movements, but are actually tied together. And I think maybe there's something there in the way in which we approach people outside of our own kind of networks and spheres. Um, and yeah, I don't know if this is reductive, but to kind of figure out like, where is it that we connect? Is there a connection there that we can kind of depart from and open up the conversation? And then a good question maybe to round up with is um, with ongoing pandemics, borders are being under are being under more and more scrutiny what are your thoughts for the near future and what types of continued organizing slash mobilizations can we expect to see i think it's it's about that kind of continued chipping away i mean particularly at the hostile environment that we have in the uk um whether it's as um helen's mentioned kind of groups like docs not cops and med act who are doing things around trying to open up um, access to healthcare that's been really shut down by the hostile environment policies through those two um, successive immigration acts, or whether it's through um, kind of research into things like right to rent, which is that policy, which means that landlords have to check tenants and lodgers um, right to be in the country before they'll rent out. Um, and that research is really important because it can form the basis of ways to kind of challenge those policies and bring them down. Um, there was a really good piece of research by the, jo the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants around right to rent, and they found that a quarter of landlords are now unwilling to rent a property to somebody with a um, foreign sounding name, was the quote. Um, so I think kind of really exposing the discrimination that these laws, what seems to us like obviously would bring about, but kind of exposing it and, and writing it out in that way um is something that is going to continue and there's so many kind of different groups and struggles that people can be involved in um in their local areas i think that's the best place to start i mean i don't have much more to add to that i think you know it's it's linking up really it's understanding that this is a shared resistance and we can't do this alone. And I think whatever, you know, whether you're a, a member of the Labour Party, for example, or um, you're connected to um, more local kind of community groups, more radical, disruptive, lefty groups, you know, there needs to be a, a kind of a shared understanding of what we're mobilizing against and what we're mobilizing for. And I think um, actually last night I was listening to Assad Rehman's talk on the C bill and on his Twitter post, he posted uh, something I had no clue about, but it was um, talking about how 
uh, people had mobilized against a similar bill in the past, and it brought together underground ravers, environmentalists, um, trade unionists, and it, there, there is this formation of a massive coalition of people who were mobilizing against this. And I think, again, that's, that's where we're going to find our power. Um, and so I think from this week's amazing actions, we can only kind of expect more. And I think getting involved right now um, is the key. Like it's so timely and it, it's perfect. And I think, you know, this book, share this book <laughs> with everyone. <laughs> so um, yeah, hopefully see you all on the streets if and when it's safe enough to do so. And that is the perfect note on which to close. So if you want to learn more about borders and you want to learn how to resist, you can buy Leah's book now. So today is publication day. Um, and I want to say a huge thanks to Leah and a huge thanks to Helen for a great conversation. And also thank you to Pluto for facilitating tonight. Um, thank you also to our audience for attending um, by Leah's book. And I hope you have a really nice evening.